Amen. Well, let's get to it tonight. There's a lot more psalms than, uh, than maybe uh, some of the last weeks. Psalm 66, to the chief musician, a song, a psalm. Make a joyful shout. <laughs> Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name, Selah. Now, this is worship. This is, this is an expression of worship, to come and to make a shout to God, make a joyful noise. The idea there of God being awesome, your King James says the word terrible. Somewhere in there from a great meaning of a word terrible, which meant awesome, which meant to have fear of God, which meant that he was greater and above everything else, somewhere in there the, the English language morphed and now terrible, terrible became something bad. Seems Satan probably had his hand in that somewhere along the way. But I, I want you to get something. Worship isn't about you. Worship isn't about me. You know, how much has been twisted in this modern expression of you come to church and I just love the worship service today and we might have expressions like, that's my favorite worship song. And, and really, we've become twisted in missing this. And if you even would look at this, say, worship is, is so much greater than the church. Worship is so much greater than the angels. Worship is so much greater than all of Israel. Worship uh, unto God is, is, is universal, if you will. Not a universal church, not a, not a, anything like that, but it is the universe that does what? That, it, that worships God. You, you understand here to make a joyful shout to God. I think David had some of the best understanding when he came down to just a, a, explain worship. He says, as long as I have breath, I will praise the Lord. Here he comes to that, make a joyful noise to God, all the earth, the whole, the whole earth, sing out the honor of his Shem, right? That's, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is the name. And uh, if, if you really study this and look at this up, I mean, Shem in scripture, when you say name, uh, it's, it's almost 700 times it implies God. You know, and so now I, I want to see Shem, I want to see name capitalized in all of our worship songs because the scriptures imply Shem or name is the name of God as much as you understand this about about the Jews and about, well, again before they were Jews Israel before they um, were kicked out of Judah they would worship God in fact when Moses in the burning bush says well who shall I say is sending me how will I how will I identify the God of their fathers, and that's when he gives them the name Lord. And we know it better as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in our English, but it's the YHWH equivalent out of the Hebrew. And they wouldn't pronounce the name of God. So when you're studying through the scriptures and you see this, and you're, here you have God, you have Elohim. This is, this is what you have. When you make a joyful shout to God, it's, it's, it's in, a, in a general sense, God, and we know that, that um, the name Jehovah usually is translated into our English Lord. So when you, see, when you see this, make his name, they're referring to him, they're referring to Yahweh without saying Yahweh. It's kind of much in the same way when we have an, an involve in an intimate relationship with God and you're speaking with God and you're praying to God as Father as Jesus taught and then you'll also be saying you to God or you'll be, you'll be personifying that expression of, of when you're praying and when you're giving God worship and you're intimate with God. Listen, I'll, I'll give you an example. You'll catch this analogy. When I'm talking to my wife, I don't, and I don't always call her Tanya. I, in, very, in very many ways when I'm speaking about her or to her, it might be a very a much a nickname or, or we'll even forego the names because we know each other and in that intimacy with God David says sing out the honor of his name and I want you to get this as you get into this that God is worshiped above all and think about what Satan tried to do and what what the Antichrist you know the dragons gonna give power to the beast his whole goal is to be worshiped above all things called God his sin Satan's sin was to be worshiped as God, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. And, and when you, you jot that down in your notes and your understanding here, and, and hear the psalmist, and this is the Spirit of God, God is to be worshiped in all the earth. A little hard to fathom right now that everybody would worship God. 
You know, of those that are the haters of God, you have all these uh, opposition. But David writes this down for he says, all the earth shall worship you. So you see why I say worship isn't about the individual. Worship is about worshiping God because he's God. God is going to be worshiped. And I, I love this about the name of Jesus. You know, so when you consider that name and honoring the name of God and honoring the name of Yeshua, right, which means Jehovah is salvation, and it comes into us out of the Greek we, where we refer to him as Jesus, the uh, Acts chapter 4, you know, after the, after the great miracle of the, the man who was 38 years lame and, and John and Peter are going up to the temple in the hour of prayer and he's asking for money and, and he's begging and, and they said, we don't have money. So, but what we do have, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have, said in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then they're called to account and Peter just boldly stands up at the name of Jesus. This man has been made whole. And then a little bit farther into Acts 4, you know, that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Lift up and exalt the name of Jesus. You understand here what David is doing in making the name of God glorious. You know, people will, will shrink back and then maybe they don't, you know, we, a lot of times we get so messed up in this world, we're like, oh, people have never heard the name Jesus. Oh, they, they will be worshiping. There is not a language, there is not, how does it, how does it say in Romans 2? There's, there's not a language on earth where the glory of God has not gone, again, my paraphrase, in the creation. God has made himself known through creation. When someone wants to know what happened and who God is, God will make a way. And it's also a great call for missionaries to come. And I just received this. To me is to have this place right here, to have a church who will never depart the worship of, of God, the one on the throne, the creator, the one whose name is glorious. And it's our task, if you will, if you can handle a task in worship, it's what we come to give God, is that God is to be worshipped by the entire earth, and we come here and say, um, right here, Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, right here, it's going to happen. We're going to come and give God worship. Now, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to lay it out there a little bit farther. Where's your personal altar? Where's your family altar? Where's worship? Because God is to be worshipped. Where's worship? And I, I like this. So you want to sing loud? Sing loud. Make a joyful noise. You know, it may, it may come out of your mouth a noise, but to God, somewhere between there and, and uh, getting up in the spiritual realm to heaven, that, that praise is beautiful to God. Make a joyful shout. Right? They shall praise your name. Beautiful place. Verse 5, come and see the work, works of God. Come, the, the word literally, uh, it, can, it can mean either like go, like if I would send you to go do something, like go therefore and make disciples of all nations, or come here. Same word, again in the context, come and see the works of God. So th what uh, the psalmist declares is, look around you, come and see, right here all the works of God are glorious. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. Boy, would that be a radical message for the world today to say, come and see the works of God. Come and see what he has done. Come and see what he is doing. And so many today want to, want to pretend that it's not God, but uh, the psalmist simply declares, he is awesome in his doing. Again, the same word there. He is to be feared in his doing toward the sons of men towards his dealings with the children of God. He turned the sea into dry land. Oh, man, there's, that's an amazing feat. Turning the sea into dry land, the wind blows all night long, the Red Sea parts, and he turned, uh, they went through the river on foot, or the flood, if you're reading out of the King James, but the word there is river, so it could be a reference to both the Red Sea and then when they crossed the Jordan and flood stage, the river to come into the promised land. Those are works of God. Come and see the works of God. Hey, just because you weren't there to see him, David, the psalmist here, he wasn't there to see him. Just because I wasn't there to see him doesn't mean they didn't happen. And that you would come now and you would see in the scripture and eyes of faith to, to look and see God did these amazing things. Now, I love technology and I love what they're finding out and, and now they can, you know, go under, under the water with scuba and with, with video technology. And underneath the, the, where the Red Sea crossing probably took place, they have coral in the shape of chariot wheels. And you, you got it. It's just absolutely amazing of the information that actually backs this up. So now we uh, can understand this. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. Who qualifies? Who here? Who in here? And who listening on the radio qualifies for sons of men? Well, that's mankind. We all do. Come and see these wonderful works of God. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. Oh, and they're going to try. 
Think about it. Satan's been going after this for some six to 10,000 years. Some 6,000 years here on earth to have himself worshipped. And he's going to get three and a half years out of the whole deal. And then fire's going to come down, right? The, uh, the false prophet, the, the uh, Antichrist, they're going to be off to the lake of fire. Satan's going to be bound for a 1,000 years. See, God rules by his power. Nations come and go. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, the Medes, the Persians, the Egyptians, I mean, Alexander the Great, the Romans, all these powers come and go, but there's going to be an eternal kingdom. So shouldn't it reflect in our worship, our faith, our understanding of what's going to take place, what's happened in the past, what's going to take place? It does for David. He says, do not let the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. Now, with all that in, in light of worship is all over the place, God has, right from the outside, been involved in the affairs of mankind, and specifically for this group of people called Israel. And now David says in verse 8, Oh, bless our God, you peoples. Think about it. Think about it as believers in, in Yeshua, right? As Christians, as ones who are born from above. I, I, I make no mistake about it. I'm talking about regenerate believers. And what God has done and put his spirit within you and you, with that understanding, we should easily be able to come to service twice a week or in your own prayer closet, wherever that altar is, and say, oh, bless our God, you peoples. The spirit of God's within, the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit in the church. Praise should erupt quite easily. And when you start to let that all sink down into your heart, worship is to be an overflow of who God is and what he has done. And uh, David says, oh, bless God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Now, we could use amplification. We could use instruments. I mean, David did what? David just put thousands of people up there. Thousands of singers, thousands, and then trumpets and instrumental. And he would make the praise of God heard from Jerusalem so that everyone around could hear the praise of Almighty God. God. I love it. I absolutely love what David writes here. Now he turns his attention to the personal side. Oh, um, and praise the, make the, make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. He holds our soul in life, is how the King James renders that. Hey, New believers, modern-day Christians, we don't focus enough on this aspect of God. People get saved, and they, and they think that, that no one's there to hold them. When you read this and understand, David says, God keeps our soul among the living. He, he holds our souls in life. God does not let your foot be moved. He's not going to let this happen to you. And that wonderful aspect of God being able to keep you, then in that response, now David just now starts to lead us through. It's not easy following God. It's not easy being the object of his love. Ask Job. Right? Ask Job if it's easy to be the object of God's love because Satan looks upon that and says what? Oh, look at you, God. You've, you've done this for Job. Of course he's going to love and bless you. Right? And so God just you know, lifts his hand of holding off a bit so Satan can get in and then Satan goes after him. You know, think about this. Verse 10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. Deuteronomy 8. Get Deuteronomy 8 into your heart. They're going into the promised land. Moses is telling them. Moses doesn't get to go with them. He says, God is going to test you and try you. In fact, that's what the wilderness was about. The testing and trying. Are you going to love God? The Christian life is about testing and trying, being purified, being refined. Think about it. Formerly an enemy, unregenerate, an enemy of God, sinful nature, carnal, created, right, that way in your mother's womb and you come out as a sinner and you're an enemy of God and then you get saved and now God's going to test and prove and try you that you may know that you love him. Because isn't that what choice is all about? See, when I talk about that in the aspect of, of husband and wife and, and the, the choice, when you have free choice and you say, we're going to lay down life, we're going to love each other, we're going to walk this out. Even in church, when you say, I'm going to love God and I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, you're simply understanding that this old nature has to be put away, the old man, and I need the new man. I need the love that comes from above and enters this heart, and I need to love. God has tested us, or God has proved us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Oh, goody, oh boy. 
painful. See, why the, fl the afflictions, why the sufferings, why the trials, why the temptations? See, and you realize that God loves you so much that when you choose him over yourself, you choose him over flesh, you choose him over, over some carnal desire, you choose him over pleasure, you cho choose him over the basics of life and say, God, I love you, I serve you, and the psalmist continues. David writes in 11, you brought us into the net, you laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. Why in the world and what in the world are you doing, God? God knows exactly what he's doing. He leads you with the promise that he'll never let your foot be moved. He keeps you, and then that, that one simple statement of the promise of God to keep you, he, he runs you through the course of the sufferings of this life, and why shouldn't he? Sin brings forth suffering, so we would understand that the, the power of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and what it wins for us in salvation and the power of that new life is to be radically powerful and different in our lives so that when affliction is laid on our backs and you cause men to ride over our heads and you, you suffer according to the will of God and you suffer because of sin and you understand that God is purifying you and he is preparing you for life with him. He wants to dwell in you right now. As the Spirit of God dwelling within you, He wants you to abide in Him. He wants to be at home in your heart. He wants you to abide in His love and His commands and, and have an intimate oneness of relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living within. And yeah, I know me. I, I know why I go through sufferings and, and putting off that the, the sin, and I make that decision that, that sin must die in me. And through the sufferings and affliction, and you look at 12, you have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Purifying terms, right? Because if, if, if an object was unclean and could pass through the fire, you purified that object that was unclean with fire, like a copper kettle. If it was an object that couldn't pass through the fire, it was to be purified with water. A great, a great picture of, if you will, baptism. You know, and, and even that shadow of what's there. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. How am I ever going to get through all the psalms i got to get through tonight? Unbelievable that God would give us the, the suffering for a moment. He would give us the, the sadness in this life. Think about the sadness that death brings. Think about that which, you know, all these things that happen in life. You know, Joseph's always that great example, uh, afflicted, sold as a slave, forgotten. And he's, he's a great picture of that. But there's countless stories of life. And David, you know, writes this and captures it. And he speaks of that men to ride over our heads, just brought low, uh, sufferings of life, sin happened upon you, whatever it was. And you realize that God is perfecting you. He's refining you. This is, he's preparing you for eternity. He wants wants you to dwell with him forever. And when you realize that, the psalmist writes, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. You brought us out to abundance. Jesus Christ did not come to destroy lives. James and John thought that for a while. Hey, should we like Elijah call fire down from heaven? After all, we just saw him on the mountain and we want a ministry like Elijah. Should we call down fire from heaven because they didn't let us pass through? They wouldn't let us come and stay overnight there? And they, Jesus like, hey, what, what spirit are you guys of? Now, I'm not trying to be casual with the words. I'm just, this is, it's got to enter your heart. And when you understand this, that Jesus Christ then boldly declares, the Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. He's our good shepherd. The shepherd says, I go before my sheep. I lead them. And he says, I didn't, I, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. This rich fulfillment, fulfillment's not in, in the original, but to help you understand that, all these afflictions and sufferings of this life, everything that happens in this life, all the pain, all the affliction, and when you remain in Christ and, you, and through whatever this world may throw at you and you stay in Christ, that's what God intended in sending Jesus. This may be the worst that you ever have to ever experience. Well, it should be, right? Think, think about it this way. For you who are saved, Earth is the closest you'll ever be to hell. Closest you'll ever get. The suffering in this life, the sin, the wickedness, all the, even no matter what mankind does to you, they cannot take away your soul. And when you see this, for the unbeliever, the earth is as close to heaven as they'll ever get. So there's a, a vast difference. Jesus Christ came that you may have life and that you may have it abundant. 
Now, he's not talking about the carnal life. He's not talking about the life in this world. He's talking about the next life. And we need to grasp this tonight because it's, it's an important thing. I'm talking about the Christ life. So when you see the psalm writing, psalmist writing the same thing, and you would say, I will suffer for the name of Jesus. I will suffer for the word of God. I won't deny his name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise and worship him no matter what anybody else thinks is acceptable, and I'm going to come and worship the Lord. I will go into your house with burnt offerings, verse 13. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats, Selah. So he turns to that great place of, of a consecrated life. A burnt offering, wholly, totally given in sacrifice to the Lord. Here's my life. Put it on the altar. Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is what it's about. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Now that's testimony. If you listen closely, he says, he's talking about making this praise glorious, making it heard, and he says, now come and hear, and I'm going to tell you about the Lord. I'm going to tell you what he has done for my soul, how he saved my life, the eternity that I'm expecting to have with him, the salvation of the cross of Jesus Christ. I cried to him with my, with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Say, so what's the instruction? Confess your sin. I mean, what, what, what's, the, what's the biggest problem for a, for a believer? Is to get into sin and then to try to make an excuse for it, and, and then he's regarding iniquity in his heart. Confess your sin and you shall be forgiven. Confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confession is such a beautiful thing. David's got his handle on it here. But certainly, God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. So a great picture there of the invisible God hearing us right here on earth. You can go into your prayer closet. You can go within your heart and you can talk silently to God and he hears your prayer. What a, what a beautiful place of faith and trust. And, and David just says, come and see the works of God. He, he names them. And then he brings it all the way back down to the inside. Say, pray to God. I've prayed to God. He has heard my prayer. God is real. God answers prayer. God desires an intimate relationship with you. Jesus invited you into the prayer closet to pray to your Father in heaven. When he tells the apostles, he says, you're not going to ask me in that day. Jesus said, I'm going away to be with the Father. You're going to ask the Father himself in my name and, and, and he will do it and he says he for the father himself loves you and all this to communicate going through the Psalms is that you are to develop a greater understanding in this intimate relationship with God of, of why worship why give praise why give testimony why why consecrate your life well it's because of the goodness of God and the salvation that he has won and the power of God to forgive sin the power of God to take you from an enemy to a son, you know, take you from an enemy to a daughter, making you children of God, and you realize the great power of God. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Psalm 67. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. Be a great way to end services, begin services, a great way to begin the day. You know, you want to pray for you want to pray for the church, you want to pray for one another. God be merciful unto us. You know, it's got that backdrop of what? God be merciful unto us sinners. Right? You think about that place of the Pharisee saying, well, I'm glad I'm not, uh, you know, like other men. I fast twice a week. I tithe. But, you know, God, I'm pretty good. And yet the sinner cries out, God, be merciful unto me. God, be merciful unto us. Bless us. Cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. May the blessing of Almighty God be upon you. May the life of Christ in you be enriched greatly. May the blessings of Almighty God bless your, your eternal life. Not the blessings of this life, not the deceitfulness of riches, not all the things that choke out the word of God, but may tonight be that place where the blessing of Almighty God comes upon you in the richness of enjoying his word. One of my regular prayers for the church is this, that we'd have a great desire for the word of God. That the word, that the spirit of God would be upon the word of God with power in our lives. That his face may shine upon us.
that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. Jesus left no question about this. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. No question, Jesus says, I'm the way. Right? Jesus lays this out, that it may be known on the earth, Oh, that the Holy Spirit of God would be upon his church, that they'd be the power, have the power of God to be witnesses of Jesus. What the apostles do? The apostles filled with the Holy Spirit, right there in Jerusalem, the Spirit of God comes upon them. What do they begin to do? They give witness. Right? They give witness, and, and with great power, they give witness of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's the way. Right? Through faith in him, you can, you can make it to heaven. Make that way known on earth. What does Jesus say to the church? As you go your way, make disciples of every nation. As you go in this life, everywhere you go, and I love it when you get to Acts chapter 8, they were scattered because of persecution, and as they went, they went out preaching the word of God. They went out preaching Christ. They went out and preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and people got saved. What in the world ever happened to what? It, it, this isn't freedom of worship in this country. It was freedom of religion. I read this, I read verse 2, and that, that your way may be known on the earth. I read that, well, who's going to tell those who don't know the way? Oh, that we'd understand. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they hear unless someone is sent? And you start to look at this and you're like, that praise and worship and that testimony of God. And what's to be declared? Your salvation among all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, sending missionaries to China when there was no believers there. Hudson Taylor going out. I mean, he, he ordered his whole life, laid it down. Uh, Dr. Livingston, right, going to Africa. Where is it that we today understand that God wants his way to be known in, in the earth, the way of salvation, to go preach in Christ Jesus that there is a remission of sins, repentance and remission of sins in Christ Jesus. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth, Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Yeah, worship seems a bit, a bit bigger than one person. You, you get what's happening here. God desired that his gospel would go forth into the whole world and that people would be saved. And out of that salvation, they would begin to praise God. And he wanted that to go into all the earth. Psalm 98 is subtle, but it makes, it makes it clear that of every tribe and tongue and nation, there is to be praise that rises up. I expect to be before the throne with all the peoples of the world who are saved from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Think about those missionaries who give their life to go to a people group, to live among them, to understand their language, and to, and to take their spoken language and give them a written language, teach them how to read, and then translate the scriptures out of the original language into the lang spoken or the written language they just gave that people group that they might receive the word of God and be saved and they can give someone can give their entire life so what so that out of that tribe tongue or nation of people they'll be before the throne of God giving God worship and praise oh don't take for granted what we do here don't take for granted for, for one instance that, that praise and worship, it just happens. You never fall into spiritual things. Never. You don't just fall into going to church. You don't fall into reading your Bible. You don't fall into prayer. You have to actively say, I am going to turn my back on flesh and sin, and I'm going to be amongst the people of this tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and we here are going to give God praise. As often as we gather together in our services, God is going to be praised and worshiped worshipped. Whole different perspective. Yeah, I can't really, you know, I can't really anymore, um, you know, skip that time where we give God worship and praise. I just like to come for the Bible study and, you know, I'll come to the study and, and then I'm going to be out of here. No. God wants us to gather. He wants us to gather as a people and he loves it. The Bible says that the praise of God is beautiful. Psalm 68. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a song. Now, you wouldn't know it's a song unless he told you it was a song because now he's going to get into 
I will look at the words. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. I don't think I've ever heard this set to music in one of the worship songs we ever put in front of church. But you understand what the psalmist is doing is he is actually asking for God to be what God is to be and he's praying and asking God to arise and avenge the enemies of God. A great place of understanding all the prayers of the saints that rise up, you get it in the book of Revelation that, that the blood of the saints have been crying out for years and God is going to avenge that bloodshed. The psalmist just puts it to music and says what? God, arise. You know, can you imagine God's on the throne and when, when God gets up, you know, and he's going to get up and he is going to send his son to earth, he is going to take the earth for himself and set up his kingdom here. And all those nations, all those enemies, all those that had fought against him or gathered to fight against him, let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. How hard is smoke to drive away? Just get a little breeze. How hard are the enemies of God going to be to drive away? Just like smoke. As wax melt before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice. Oh, just a little bit. See, exceedingly. I want you to read the Psalms and get into your heart that God wants exceedingly abundant, joyful worship from our lives. And just to, to catch all these things. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Again, there's the reference, you know, his name. It's, it's a clear reference of, of the identity of God. Extol him who rides on the clouds. By his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So he takes a, uh, an, an individual who is alone and gives him a wife, and they have a children and a family. He takes the, the sinner and saves them and puts them into the body of Christ. You, you see this work that God's doing. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. You think of Isaiah 61. Jesus Christ came to set the captive free. O oh God, verse 7, when you went out before you, your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah. Now, I love reading the, the account of God, um, you know, through the, the, ten, the ten plagues, the miraculous right arm power of God to bring his children out of Egypt. And it says that he brought them out as an army. Now, I don't think it's because they were marking, marching in ranks or that they had weapons. I don't know. Is that God himself was marching before them and they were, they were coming out. Now, they might have been orderly, but it wasn't that they were armies. Is that they were the people of God. God marched through the wilderness. The earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. The Lord gave us the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bishan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bishan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of peaks, many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. Now you just got a great recap of what God did in the wilderness, bringing them out of Israel, and he brought them water, water from the rock. He brought them, they're crying out and complaining, he leads them to an oasis. God brought water and food to his people, and uh, he brings them into the promised land. And that reference there of 15, a mountain of God, the King James renders it, is like the mountains of Bashan. The idea that uh, Jerusalem is going to be exalted above all the other mountains, Isaiah chapter 2. And you realize that that's the place where God desires to dwell amongst his people in Jerusalem, in Zion. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever.
Amazing what David had here in the Psalms. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. Okay, so Elijah calls down fire from heaven, and James and John are like, okay, so Jesus is coming up to Jerusalem. Maybe this, we're going to see thousands and thousands. Maybe the armies of God are coming. Ah, Jesus, are you now going to set up your kingdom? Missing what he said to them, he says, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and die, and I'm going to be resurrected. And they're like, whew, right over their head. So like, should we call down fire from heaven? He says, no, no. He says, he says to them, no, it's, it's, it's not for you to know the, the time which the Father kept for himself. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And that's been going on for almost 2,000 years now. The power of God is to be upon the church, to be his witnesses, because there's going to come a time, and verse 17 talks about it. You know how it works. Right? In Elisha's day, the enemy comes, starts surrounding the whole city there, and Elijah simply prays because his, his servant is all like, oh no, the enemy's here. They're surrounding us by all these chariots. And, and he just prays, God, open his eyes. And then he sees all the chariots of God surrounding the chariots of man and the chariots of fire and the angels. And one angel destroys 185,000 in one night. And get this, when God says, okay, now it's time. Mankind is, is so wrapped up into mankind and the kingdom of man, and they're, they're saying there is no God, and, and it's just starting to roll downhill like a big snowball and gathering speed and, and more and more enemies of God. And, and the Antichrist, I mean, if you read your scriptures with a prophetic eye, this is coming so rapidly. Jesus said, right, when these things become, begin to come to pass, he says they're going to they're gonna happen quickly. So here we are, the righteous, with the promise that will stand. We see the promises of God. We see the propheticness of this psalm that Jerusalem is going to be exalted. And when is it going to be exalted? Well, when the Lord comes back with chariots of God, 20,000, thousands upon thousands, Revelation 19. Jesus now coming back on a white horse. And this is all in the psalms. This is our worship, the prophetic element of worship. You know, worshiping about the Lord's return, worshiping about God coming, the Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You have ascended on high, you have led captivity captive. That's quoted in Ephesians 4 from Jesus' first coming. So you see how scholars and people looking back and scribes and looking at the scriptures like, oh, the Messiah. There's, there's, uh, is there two Messiahs? Is there, they, they couldn't see this to uh, first and second coming. So in the first coming, Jesus dies, goes, uh, descends into hell, and then he leads captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with tasks. Oh, this is so hard. What do I have to do for God? No, that's a religion. A religion always has something to do for God. Oh, the grace of God would be received in your heart. Look at this. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, the grace of God daily poured out upon you, the, his goodness, his kindness. Our God is the God of salvation. And to God, the Lord belong escapes from death. Isn't that really what we're offering right now? You, you preach the gospel to somebody, you're really offering them an escape from death. Because you're preaching in Christ Jesus through faith in him, what he did for you on the cross, your sins are forgiven and you will live forevermore. You get an escape from death. But God who will wound the head of our enemies, of his enemies, excuse me, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. Every time I read the book of Revelation, I'm still blown away. And all these things came to pass, and these, the, the wrath of God is coming upon the earth. The judgments of God are coming upon the inhabitants of the earth, and they know it's God, and the Bible says they would not repent. It always blows, and here's that, the, the trespasses of man, they would not repent. The Lord said, I will bring back from Bashan, I will bring them back from the depths of the sea. Again, a promise to Israel. Remember this, this, this backdrop. He'll bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may crush them in blood, and the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from your enemies. They have seen your possession, procession, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. Now, Jesus is going to come back, and that, that, that eastern gate is going to be opened up, and he, there is going to be a procession. He is going to come up into the temple. 
The singers went before the players of instruments followed after. Among them were the maidens playing timbrels. Bless God in the congregations, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. Now, great phrase there. I'd love to give a Bible study on that one verse. Jeremiah twice warns. Jeremiah 2.13 and 17.3. 2.13 and 17.13 warns Israel that they have rejected the fountain of the living God. The fountain of Israel. They rejected it and said to exchange it for a cistern. Worshipped other gods. And, and that warning to them that Israel had rejected and Jeremiah then also gives the promise of the new covenant. And the branch would come. I mean, Jeremiah's got incredible prophecies. But guess, get this. It arrived out of their rejection that God then says, here's what I'm going to do. So in this fountain of Israel, it's going to be restored unto Israel when? When the Messiah returns. Oh, the Messiah came in his first coming and they rejected him. You see the backdrop of Jeremiah in that they rejected God in, in their day. <clears throat> they rejected the Messiah. Israel rejected the Messiah in his first coming. They're going to receive the fountain of Israel. Again, a reference to the Messiah in his second coming. And Zechariah 13.1 says that there's going to be a fountain uh, to forgive sin in Israel. Absolutely blown away. And, that's in, and when's this going to happen? The second coming of Christ. When he comes with all the armies of heaven. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O God, what you have done for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Rebuke the beasts of the reeds, the herd of the bulls with the calves of the peoples, till everyone submits himself with pieces of silver. When Jesus comes back, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Those nations that don't come up, he is going to rebuke them. He's going to cause rain not to fall on their land. Again, a wonderful psalm here speaking of the kingdom of God. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Again, all kingdom age prophetic psalm type of things. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises to the Lord, Selah. That's what it's going to be like in the kingdom. Jesus here on earth, on the throne, and all the nations of the world are going to come and gather and give God worship right here on earth. Beautiful psalm. Maybe, maybe they'll turn to Psalm 68 in the kingdom age. I don't know. What a, what a great understanding it is for us. To him who rides on, on the heaven of heavens, which were of old, indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice, ascribes strength to God. His excellence is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Now the prophetic element of the Word of God. Here we are in a day and age when what we do is less and less popular. It's not flashy. It's not showy. You know, it's not entertaining. But it's true. I love those that held fast to God's word in all those years in which Israel was not a nation. And you can read these guys who said, I will hold fast that Israel will be a nation again because God has all these promises to fulfill for Israel. I say to you, follow those men, follow those believers who held fast the word of God and everything that you get of this, give God worship because he's worthy of worship. He's coming back. Jesus is returning. He's setting up his kingdom here. No matter how bad things get here, no matter how much the kingdom of man seems to overtake, do not fear those things that will come upon you for the Lord's coming back. You know, may it be that our, our hearts and our minds are on, uh, just on fire for what the Lord wants to do in our lives.